Hello, good morning, everybody. Welcome to a new seminar in the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalucía in Granada, in Spain. And today we will have the talk by Dr. Caballero Garcia, Maria Caballero Garcia, from our institute, from IIA. And she will talk about time, time domain astronomy with future X-ray satellites. Dr. Maria Caballero Garcia is a researcher at the Spanish National Research Council, CSIC, here at the Astronomical Institute of Andalusia under a Ramonica Hall program. Previously, she was a researcher at the Astronomical Institute of the Czech Academy of Science in Prague. There, she was the PI of the Czech Grand Agency's project entitled X-rays reverberation mapping in a creating black holes. She has been developing her, her, her career through five postdocs at the University of Cambridge, University of Crete, Observatorio Astronomico de Brera, and uh, as, I, as I mentioned at Czech Republic. During this time, she has, has become a specialist in X-ray astronomy with a special emphasis on the spectroscopic and timing analysis modeling of X-ray data from accreting black holes. Currently, she's extending her work in the study of the physical processes occur occurring during the final stage of the life of massive star. She is also serving to the ESA science study team for the Teseus satellites, previous ESA M5 uh, candidate and currently under phase two study and chair of its, its, its science working group, Time Domain Astronomy. So uh, thank you very much, Maria, for accepting this invitation to give in a talk. And um, the floor is yours. Many thanks, René, for this in beautiful introduction. So and um, for this invitation to give a talk in, this, in, in the IAA, actually my, my first. So I will, I will start now. I'm going to talk about the time domain astronomy with future X-ray satellites. Um, as uh, René said, I'm, um, I'm working in the science study team, previous science study team of the Theseus proposed mission to ESA during the last uh, M5 call. Uh, currently, as a starting point, uh, these are the current ESA X-ray telescopes. Uh, we, we have uh, XMN Newton, that is this uh, focusing X-ray um, satellite uh, mirror telescope, uh, uh, and it is devoted to, to, to the study of uh, X-ray emitting sources with a relatively not uh, very large field of view, but this is uh, when it studies a source, it is just focusing on it and, and studying, taking all the X-ray photons from it, and also the ultraviolet photons detected from the uh, by the U-boat telescope on board. There is another telescope that is uh, ESA and NASA collaboration. This one is a collaboration with NASA, and it's called the SWIFT. This one is is based on coded uh, masks optics and. The, with two X-ray telescopes, one that are the XRT telescopes, the BAT uh, telescope, that is the bigger uh, uh, field of view imager in, at high energies, and also the another um, uh, telescope uh, ultraviolet that is called the U-BOT. I apologize, I said U-BOT in XMM, but it is the optical monitor in the OM instead. Uh, with this uh, big field of view for the bat, the, the goal is to detect a large uh, field of view uh, in the sky. So, um, uh, so the events that are the gamma ray bars that are occurring at any direction of the sky can be covered easily because we don't know when they happen and where in the, in the sky. And then there is another ESA mission that is the integral integral mission that is based also on the coded mask optics. It contains the, the EBIS imager, that is this, this one here, uh, that is detecting hard X-rays. Also, the, there are two monitors that are called the GMX, uh, are softer, uh, uh, detect uh, photons from softer energy range, and the SPI, that is uh, detecting the highest energy 
photons uh, from the from the X-ray sky. Uh, the purpose of the satellite is to detect uh, not only uh, it it doesn't have such a field of view like a Swift Observatory because it's not devoted only to the detection of uh, of gamma ray bars, but is uh, more focused to the study of uh, gamma ray transients uh, in the galaxy, in our galaxy. Uh, this is the list of all the missions of, uh, of all the observatories uh, by uh, sent to space by ESA uh, in the whole in electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, we go, we have here the microwaves, and if we go to the right. As we go to the right, we go to higher energies going to the gamma rays in, in the right side. So uh, the ones in the middle are the ones that are working right now, which the ones in the bottom are the ones that are in the legacy of the archive. The ones in the bottom uh, in the X-ray domain, uh, you, as you see, is XMM Newton and Integral. We got uh, these two ones. And in the concepts in development, right now we got all of these in the optical, uh, also these uh, ones uh, in the infrared optical. In X rays, we got the series uh, that is for a high resolution spectroscopy and is collaboration with Japan. The Einstein telescope that is a collaboration with China and is devoted to multi messenger astronomy. And the Athena uh, telescope that is also in concept, well, it is actually been adopted, has been adopted is for the study like XMM of certain X-ray emitting sources in the sky. There is also the LISA that will be studying not in the gamma ray, in the electromagnetic domain, but in the gravitational wave domain, that is the messenger, uh, another messenger of the sky, that is the gamma um, gravitational wave domain. And here is the Theseus uh, proposed mission to M5 that was finally not, ad not adopted in M5, but we are working through the through proposing it again for uh, the next call that is the M7 call. <clears throat> here we, we got all the all the missions accepted recently by, by ESA uh, at the, in the small missions and fast missions are the the cheapest missions uh, that have been accepted uh, by ESA recently in the FAST2, in the F2 program, uh, in the F2 call, uh, is the last one. And here in the, in the middle is the, the missions with more, uh, more budget, already accepted these ones that are uh, with a budget around 500 million euros. And in the M5, uh, the last one, uh, uh, Ambition was selected, that is a planetary mission to Venus. And these are uh, the ones that the large missions with a uh, budget uh, higher than 500 million euros by, provided by ESA, that the recent ones are the US, Athena, and Lisa. What is the goal of Theseus? Theseus is the acronym of the Transient High Energy Sky and Early Universe Surveyor. And, and the goal is, is to study uh, uh, all the gamma ray bars down to the first, uh, to the period of the reionization of the universe. I mean, in, in the, in the range is higher than six until 10. In these in the, this, uh, explosions, gamma ray bars will allow us to understand the, the environments uh, and the first structures in the universe will allow us also to understand the population three stars that are the more massive uh, stars known in the universe. And when they explode, uh, they are the candidates, they give us to the candidates of more massive black holes uh, given in this period of time. And uh, all, all of these things are, are very cosmologically very interested, interesting. But also another theme that is a secondary goal of Theseus is the study of the gravitational wave counterparts in the electromagnetic spectrum. And the previous consortium as proposed in the M5 call was constituted by all these countries with these countries leading the consortium, Italy, United Kingdom, France, Denmark, and Switzerland. 
and Spain going in the in the second in this in the following contribution and then all of these countries and currently for the next uh, call uh, there will be some countries added to the list if accepted this is the the mission as it was proposed and, and developed during the SM5 if accepted as ESA, ESA M7 that uh, already has not been uh, selected for a study, but if, if it would go through a study and accepted, it would be launched in 2037, in the 2037. So it will be simultaneous to many gravitational, to the third generation of gravitational wave observers on Earth. And also with Lisa, Athena, and as I will explain in a, in a while. So during the ESA M5 study, we, with the, the industries developed two models. This is uh, the model developed by the Airbus, and this is the, the model developed by Tels Alenia, Tels Alenia. Uh, and they are both very similar. Uh, as I will explain here, the telescope is like this. Uh, it has got uh, two, two axis units that are the units uh, with the biggest field of view. Uh, both of them provide a big field of view and also the instruments with the higher gamma, higher gamma ray detectors, highest gamma ray detectors, and also the softer X-ray units that are these ones. They are two units. They also cover a very uh, big field of view uh, that is uh, good for the follow-up of gamma ray transients that are random events in the sky. And there will be on board an IRT telescope that it will be 70 centimeters of diameter. So um, with the spectra, with the spectros, spectrometer uh, also included in order to determine on board the redshift of the gamma ray bars that located uh, from the redshift universe that we are expected to be emitting in the infrared. Here I explain in detail what are the, the soft ray imagers that it's covering the 0.3 to 5 kilo electron volts. And this, are, is, this is consisted by a set of two lobsterite telescopes with a field of view of 0.5 stereoradians with an accuracy, pointing accuracy between one and two are minutes. The infrared telescope that is working in this range of the infrared between 0.7 and 1.8 micrometers it's a 0.7 meter class infrared telescope with a 15 by 15 field of view. Uh, and it, uh, it works in both imaging and spectroscopy uh, um, capabilities. The X-rays, uh, uh, the X that is the acronym of X gamma rays imaging spectrometers works in this wide uh, energy range between two kilo electron volts to 20 mil, uh, m electron volts. And it's a set of two coded mass cameras uh, with the last technology, uh, monolithic uh, bars of silicon diodes coupled with uh, cesium crystal scintillators. It provides two stereo radians as a field of view and a short location accuracy of 10 minutes in the two to 20, 150 kilo electron volts, whilst in the energies higher than 150 kilo electron volts, it covers higher field of view of uh, four stereo radians. That is almost the source of the sky. Uh, but uh, in this case, we uh, only provide imaging. We don't provide the spectroscopy for this energy, for this uh, high energy range. Here we go into detail in, into one of these uh, modules of the SXI, uh, where you can see this uh, peculiar shape that is not uh, flat, but is curved and is composed by many cells. This is the, the so-called lobster, uh, um, lobster eye technology, focusing technology that has been already uh, applied in other telescopes uh, by ESA uh, and also by NASA. And the focal plane detector is not a CCD anymore because this technology would be out of date in the, in the future. So we, we have to move to the CMOS technology. That is the one that is going to be uh, available at that time. 
This is what is called, why is it called lobster eye technology for these te telescopes? Because the, it is based on the, te on the nature. Uh, lobster is the name of this uh, crab that is in the, the this crustacean <laughs> that the animals that uh, live on the rivers. And uh, you can see that this eye is uh, is very. I mean, you the animal can look at any direction of the of the sky, and uh, it has many cells. The, when we look at very very close in, into this eye, and this is the artificial uh, structure made by humans, we're trying to resemble this natural structure from the crab. So uh, with this way, we pretend to detect. Uh, X-rays coming from any direction of the sky as far as possible and with the highest uh, sensitivity possible. This is the typical uh, PSF from a from a from an X-ray uh, source detected with the lo lobster eye technology. Uh, is uh, characteristic because it has four wings, as we can see here. Uh, and this is uh, technology has been already applied for the Rosita e Rosita uh, telescope, uh, this German German Russian mission. And uh, with this technology, we have seen from Rosita that we can obtain very beautiful images uh, from the X-ray sky because it has a very high um, sensitivity and um, wide field of view. Then we go to the structure of the EXIS uh, monitor. Uh, that it, this is one module of this monitor. Uh, we see here the coded mask, and this is the, the tube of the, of the monitor. Uh, you can detect a very, thanks to the, this length and the material inside, you can detect uh, this energy growth energy range of photons between two kilo electron volts to 20 mega electron volts. Uh, uh, so, um, here we go into the structure of this of this uh, monitor uh, of this module. Uh, we see here an scheme. The photon, uh, the X-ray photon, uh, comes here, and it passes through this this uh, tube. In the surface here, uh, you can detect the softest uh, X-rays or gamma rays. With the deep, the gamma rays, uh, uh, because they are more powerful. They go deeper into the without being detected by the surface, but it gets detected by the scintillator detector. And uh, it, this is the way to detect these the deeper gamma ray photons. And then the luckiest ones go into the detector area that are detected and are where you can apply the codes mass technologies that are already used by current SWIFT and integral satellites in order to detect, uh, detect this elusive, but already um, often detected uh, photons. This is the infrared telescope. Um, and uh, it is based on the, it is an, an, of consisting by an of axis course telescope uh, that it's, uh, it has this structure the, and the rays in the infrared will be traveling in this way that you can see that is uh, not a typical and um, I mean it's it's like a very compressed way to to make the photons uh, to travel they but come yeah, here. Maria, yes. sorry. this this slide we cannot see it the new one the, the infrared telescope for some reason so now now yes now. Oh, okay. sorry Okay, so the, this is the, the infrared telescope, but this course uh, structure, you can see that the photons uh, are going uh, in this way that uh, in, a, in order to, to make in a compact region, the detection of these photons by a spectrograph and imager. So uh, uh, what is the goal of this, of the Theseus satellite? The core, uh, Theseus satellite has uh, as a good core program, the detection of the gamma ray bars in the or or the as far as in the, in this area between redshift six and redshift ten, uh, this is the area that is the right the period of the reionization of the universe. Maybe we can detect any. It depends on the transparency of the of the gas when it was during the dark ages, uh, right after the 
the um, explosion of the Big Bang. So this period is between 400 million uh, years after the Big Bang and 1 billion years after the Big Bang. Uh, so with the detection of these gamma ray bars, you, you, you can study many properties of the gas surrounding these events. And we, this will allow us to, to detect, uh, to, to, to derive properties of the matter in this period of the universe uh, very poorly studied so far, but uh, it will be uh, studied uh, currently and in the near future by the James Webb Telescope. Nevertheless, we, we expect to, to discover more events or more interesting physical phenomena using the X-rays instead of the pure infrared. And this is why we claim that Theseus for the study of the epoch, the organization is also, it will be also very important and interesting to use tool. Um, the second goal, uh, goal for the core program is the, is the study of the gravitational waves. You know, as far as uh, uh, that the, the most explosive immense in, uh, phenomena in the universe uh, originate, like for example, the, the collision of two neutron stars of two black holes produce the most energetic uh, phenomena in the universe. And the, these are called the gamma ray bars because they emit in gamma rays, but they also emit in, in gravitational waves. And here you, you can see the emission in gravitational waves as it was detected by ground, by the, by the LIGO interferometer. And here you can see the, the frequency of the, was going very, very high of this, uh, of this event, uh, of, the, uh, of the turning around between both uh, components of the binary until they collided. Uh, until it, uh, they collapse it, that is the time zero for gravitational waves. And in the electromagnetic uh, emission, we saw that uh, after uh, some period of time, there was a pulse in the gamma rays. And this is what we detected uh, as electromagnetic counterpart uh, from ground with the integral satellite and other satellites uh, from ground. So with this, we will be able, sorry, to detect these events in, real, in near real time. We don't need to, to, to wait uh, on ground, but it will be detected uh, in near real time. Um, but the cells will not be working alone in spite of uh, its autonomous properties. It will interact with, uh, with, other, uh, with other large observatories that will be available by that time uh, at the end of the 30s, uh, beginning of the, well, the 40s, uh, that will be the 30, uh, the 30, the 30 meter telescopes on Earth, like the extremely large telescope. Also, well, we don't know exactly if it will be leaving the Rubin Observatory by then, hopefully. And the uh, square kilometer arrays, also the, the, uh, the, Terence, uh, the Cherenkov telescope array, the neutrino detectors, and also the third generation of gravitational wave detectors that will be operated, uh, operating by then. Uh, Theseus will be able to, to provide alerts to all these, and also to Athena, I forgot to tell, uh, will be able to provide alerts to all these uh, uh, telescopes and infrastructures uh, in space and on Earth, and it will also be getting alerts from them to observe uh, some interesting targets provided by them. So this is the sense of the double arrow here. As I, uh, here I show the, the two possible uh, possible uh, structures, uh, very possible that we will work in uh, telescopes on, on ground in the 30s. That will be will have also 30 meters. I mean, uh, with diameter telescopes. Uh, so this is the Magellan in the right, and he. This is the. Uh, this is sorry. This is the Magellan, and this is the 30 meter telescopes. And not only this, it will be also measuring as an subsidiary program will be measuring uh, also any transient in the sky. Uh, that is, uh, for example, uh, black holes, uh, 
Novi, thermonuclear bars, any transient uh, phenomena that will be emitting in high energies or will be, or that will be interesting to be observed in infrared, in near infrared, will be observed also by the by this satellite. These are the sources interesting in X-rays uh, to be observed by in the auxiliary program that is called also the time domain astronomy program uh, by Theseus, uh, the time domain because it, it, it will be observed in X-rays uh, in the X-ray time, time domain. Uh, this is time and this is the flux of these sources. The, the most powerful sources uh, are the magnetars that will be observed with short exposure times and they have the, the, the highest fluxes. Afterwards, immediately the thermonuclear bars and then we will be having the X-ray binaries the classical novi, the flaring stars, AGNs, also, but we need uh, longer exposure times uh, for all this, uh, for, for um, the AGNs, transient radiation events, and ultraluminous X-ray sources. Or you can have, a, you can see a beautiful review of all these cases and how they will be observed with issues in this paper that I show here by Mereghetti et al. in 2021. Uh, published in Experimental Astronomy. And now I go to the X-ray spectroscopy and timing uh, studies that I have been doing during, during my career, uh, previously coming to, to, to here to the, to, the, as, uh, in, to the Instituto Astrofisica de Andalucía. And I will be focusing, uh, this is a study, these are st interesting sources to be studied for the X-ray facilities uh, by Theseus, Athena, and, and all the X-ray facilities that will be in the, in the future. Uh, and I will be focusing on accreting collapsed stars or uh, what is the same X-ray emitting black holes. Black holes are interesting, as you know, the, the Physics Nobel Prize in 2000, awarded uh, in 2020, it was awarded because of the discovery of black holes and the determination uh, of the properties of the stars in the, galaxies, in the galactic center of our Milky Way that, infer, uh, that are possible only due to the existence of a big mass black hole in the center of our galaxy. So these were uh, the, the people awarded by this Nobel Prize, Penrose by the, by the contribution, theoretical contribution, and Andrea Goetz and Gensel uh, because of the uh, observational, observational contribution. As uh, you have probably known, uh, black holes are characterized Mm, theoretically, by the charge, the mass, and the spin. If we suppose that the charge is zero, and we don't care about the, the, this theorem, the no hair, we consider that the uh, black holes don't have no hair; they are bald, so they they can be characterized only by mass and the spin. So, how can we weight uh, X-ray uh, black holes? How can we calculate the mass of black holes? So one of the ways is through X-ray spectroscopy uh, from the standard, uh, one second, uh, uh, from the standard accretion disk theory applicable to sub eddington flows. We have seen that from the X-ray uh, spectrum, we can measure the, the temperature, uh, the mass of the black hole through the measurement of the, ma of the maximum depth temperature of the black body emission uh, coming from these disks. So from this peak here, uh, uh, that is the, this gives the, the temperature of the innermost part of the accretion disk that is emitting in X-rays. And this uh, temperature is related to the mass of the black hole through this power. So, so the more massive black holes will be given colder, uh, colder accretion disks. Uh, black body components. Uh, also, the X-rays uh, from accreting black holes is, quite, is, is, is rather noisy, so we need some devices uh, trying to deconvolve this noise and produce it into uh, um, understandable uh, signal, uh, like passing some noise into a passband uh, coder. Uh, here I represent it like a radio, an analogical radio. 
So here, this is the typical light curve from a black hole. You can see that it is rather chaotic, but it, in any way, you can see some kind of periodicity that is not real periodicity, but is quasi-periodicity. Uh, if we pass this through the, to the power domain, uh, so you, you can see that the, it, it is translates into frequency, into some kind of uh, noise at low frequencies. Uh, that is, this kind of noise is, is uh, white uh, red noise because it appears at low frequencies. And then at higher frequencies, we detect a, an absolutely random noise that it is the white noise, the coil noise, the so called white noise. Why the study of this noise is characteristic? Because uh, it is related to characteristic time scales to the, so, uh, of, the, of, the, of the system. So we can understand the physics of the system. We can infer uh, binary properties and they are also extremely precise. You know about the, these uh, periods that, from the pulsars that uh, can tell us uh, about the period of the binary pulsars. And he gave the Nobel Prize uh, of the pulsars to them. Catherine, well, we know this story of Catherine Barner uh, that she got the Nobel Prize, not she, but the, the uh, her advisor. Well, we can determine the orbital periods of these of these binaries. We can determine the, the size of the emission regions and occulting objects, and also the orbital evolution. This is for the people who study binary orbits in general. But in my case, I, I'm focusing to the, to the accretion phenomena occurring in black holes. Uh, so the study of the fast variability, and we do it through the study of the broad, broadband variability, through the study of the quasi-periodic oscillations. In the case of neutron stars, it is through the study of the bars and superbars, but I will not uh, mention them in here, and through the energy-dependent delays or phase, so-called phase lags in the, in the literature. So uh, what can time in, in black holes tell, tell us about? Um, if uh, the matter is extending, the matter is extending, the, ma the matter that emits uh, in X-rays is extending down the event or uh, to the until the event horizon of the black hole. And the size of this event horizon is proportional, the radius is proportional to the mass of the black hole. So the bigger the black hole, uh, in mass, uh, the bigger this radius is, and also the colder the emission is. Uh, but if we, and the colder the spectrum will be. But uh, if the uh, matter extends to this uh, to this or final orbit, uh, this will be the fastest orbit of the, of the accretion disk. And sometimes we can detect some high frequency QPOs that are coming from, that can be interpreted as the last stable orbit from this uh, accreting black hole that is usually not so stable and that is giving rise to some quasi-periodic quasi -periodic oscillations in the X-ray emission, as we can see here. This, uh, this, this is the X-ray emission, this is the frequency, and this is the power. Uh, we see that we don't see a strictly periodic signal. Uh, the, we, see quasi, we see that um, should be seen in, in if the signal would be exactly periodic, but we see that it is quasi-periodic, so it is a bit broadened. And it is at relatively high frequency, as expected from the innermost stable orbit of a, of a stellar mass black hole, that is a few hundred uh, uh, hertz. So this is uh, commensurable to the uh, last stable orbit of, uh, of, a, of an accreting black hole. Uh, these uh, quasi-periodic oscillations were interpreted as, as coming from the from the last stable orbit in around uh, this uh, black hole binary, the C60 J1550 minus 564. Um, there are also another kind of quasi-periodic oscillations, but they are low frequency quasi-periodic oscillations. They don't appear at hundreds of hertz. They appear rather at uh, 10, 10 hertz or even less. And they are not related to the innermost regions of the accretion disk. They are related more to the farther regions uh, from the black hole. We don't know yet from what part of the or what phenomena are they coming from, uh, are giving rise to these, to these features. 
but they can be classified as three types of features, type A features uh, that are in this, in this kind of, of, uh, of noise, and um, these peaks, this kind of peaks, uh, and they are relatively low, low signal. Uh, then the type B features that are slightly more coherent and they appear with other features as well, quasi-periodic uh, and with relatively weak power at low frequencies. And then the most um, known and the, the ones that can give us more information that they are the type C features that you have a, you, you have a, more, uh, a more prominent QPO typically with uh, some others all as well and a more powerful low frequency noise here. So these features uh, are usually associated to, to the accretion rate uh, of the, of the or accretion state of the black hole rather than the inner most stable orbit of the black hole. What is the accretion state of the black hole? Let me change the time. Okay. Uh, the accretion state of the black hole. Uh, so we, we have the black holes uh, as the accretion rate increases, as we see here in the diagram. Uh, they pass through different states. The first one is the quiescence, the quiescent state. Then it goes to the hard state, that this is, it is this one. Then it passes through the intermediate state and it finishes in the thermal state, thermal dominant state. This is in the in the in the if we consider uh, the geometrically the optically thin and geometrically thick corona, and we interpret that the corona is ADAF, as it can be seen in this paper, famous paper was seen. We have the accretion disk as the accretion rate mesh, uh, increases, is extending down and down and closer closer to the black hole. And the innermost part of the accretion, this is uh, filled by this corona that is in principle very thin, uh, optically thin, but it increases in optical depth as the accretion rate, rate increases. Uh, we also have this jet uh, that is coming from the innermost parts and is, is the black hole expelling matter um, outside that is also increasing uh, its density as the accretion rate increases. And at some point during the thermal state, this, uh, this corona that has been very dense uh, in, during the intermediate state and also the, the jet disappear. They both disappear. It's like the corona gets cool, cold enough uh, that the electrons just uh, condensate and all the matter is expelled through the jet. And then we, we end with this thermal state that has no yet, no corona, but has a, a, an accretion, dit, an accretion disk that is extending down to the innermost stable orbit of this black hole. This is the spectral evolution uh, of this uh, emission of a typical black hole, uh, GX339 minus four. Uh, we, we see it here the typical spectrum of a uh, black hole in the, during the low hard state and a bit enter into the hard intermediate state. This is the evolution to the soft intermediate state that is getting more emissions from the thermal component from the innermost part of the accretion disk. And this is uh, when it gets softer and softer. And this is when it gets to the high soft or thermal dominant state when we see that the corona is emitting very low in the high energies, and we got a prominent emission from the innermost part, thermal innermost part of the accretion disk. This is the typical uh, Q diagram of an accreting black hole uh, in the standard accretion disk theory as uh, GX 39 minus four is following typically. So the Q diagram, this is the hardness and this is the, the intensity. Uh, and uh, we call it Q diagram because the, uh, the stars, um, the accretion in black holes start in this point in, during the low state. And then the accretion, uh, the intensity increases. Uh, the, the low hard state uh, develops like this. The intensity increases without any deviation of the uh, almost any deviation of the ha of the hardness that is the hardest that can have a black hole, 
And during this period, uh, there is only compact emission by a jet in observed in radio and infrared. And in this point, uh, when the intensity is the highest, then uh, the, um, the black hole goes through this line that is the is uh, going down through the hard intermediate state down to the safe, soft intermediate state. It is getting softer, but the intensity doesn't change my, much. But we see that during the soft intermediate state, uh, there, there has been an episode of the blob emitting corona uh, in, in radio and also in the infrared. So we see that, that uh, the spectra starts to change in hardness madly. Also, the intensity changes a bit. Here is where we see the, uh, the uh, kind C, type C QPOs. And uh, then it goes to the thermal dominated states when the QPOs disappear. The, the radio emission and infrared emission disappear as well. And we only have the uh, ray emission from a thermal disk. Then, when the intensity gets of the disk gets low enough, uh, then it, uh, it and the accretion rate is supposed to be low enough. Then it goes back to the point of started point through a hysterical process because it doesn't go at the same process as we it was coming in. It goes back uh, with a different intensity, but it goes back in a similar way, but with much lower intensity down to the quiescent state. So these are the properties in detail that I have been telling to you, uh, but I will not uh, tell you in the in, in words uh, because I, I have explained it to you more or less in the, in the previous slides graphically. But uh, this, this picture, the code diagram and this standard uh, disk uh, theory picture, Sometimes it's not working, and this is, for example, it's not, it's not working for the for this microquasar in our galaxy, binary called GRS nineteen fifteen plus ten. This is a source that in, in during most of the time and during decades actually it's accreting at near the Eddington rate. Uh, so its inner uh, it is also experiencing uh, experiencing some uh, state evolution that is not the Q the Q shaped diagram that I showed you before, but uh, rather the inner this radius decreases when the accretion rate is decreasing, also when the luminosity is decreasing, and it is as opposite uh, what, of what we expect in the in the standard theory. So it's like uh, when when the innermost part of the accretion disk is is closer to the black hole, we don't have jet emission, and we don't have um, we don't have um, the emission typical uh, of uh, we don't have the highest intensity, and this is this was difficult to interpret interpret in the form, in the framework of the standard accretion disk theory. So we have to move to another uh, kind of accretion theory. And we, at the end, after several years of discussions, uh, the people have arrived to the consensus that uh, we have to move to the thick accretion disk theory or the slim disk theory. The accretion disk is not as uh, optically uh, thick and geometrically thin as we were supposing but it's rather the opposite, is optically, optically thick and geometrically, no, geometrically thick and optically thin, as I will explain later. So instead of a Q-shaped diagram, as we can see here for a highly accreting source that it is this one, NGC 5408 X minus one, the source gets stuck into a small range of the Q-shaped diagram, and it moves in this uh, during this whole period of accretion, and it gets stuck in in this uh, small area. Uh, so uh, for these uh, sources that are the so-called highly accreting sources with a different uh, emitting uh, emitting process that we uh, suppose but we don't know yet what is this slim disk accretion regime is. Uh, if we analyze in the standard accretion rate theory, we, we apply the same borders that we know in the, in the uh, standard uh, 
accretion rate theory, we, we uh, can, uh, the X ray spectrum can be decomposed by the power law in the high energies and the soft black body component with a very cold temperature of 0.1, between 0.1 and 0.5 kilo electron volts, that it is translated to a very, is cold, so it can be translated to very high. Uh, black mass black hole being with 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4 solar masses. But this, uh, this has been seen three years that uh, this is not possible. These black holes uh, don't exist. We don't know of them uh, through the X-ray spectroscopy so far. And we also, when we, we try to represent the black hole binaries during the, in, in this diagram, uh, temperature luminosity diagram, um, we take all the black holes known in the galaxy uh, that fall, uh, many of them follow the, the expected uh, standard accretion this theory that are the, this, this, that is the line here. But um, the ones that don't follow the standard accretion this theory and are supposed to be highly accreting sources are these ones in the circle. That, is the, that are the highly accreting sources. They are all stuck in spite of uh, spanning large amount of luminosities in a low uh, frequency, in a low temperature and range that is point between 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.5 uh, kilo electron volts, this temperature, cold temperatures. So this implies that we are uh, telling they all, if the standard accretion this theory would be right, that they all will we have point between 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4 uh, solar masses, but we know that it is not true. So uh, the theory we are interpreting this, uh, these ones is not correct, and we have to move to another theory. Uh, with this another theory, and if we understand that these ones are accreting at super Eddington level, not the standard regime, but in the super Eddington level, and then we infer masses of uh, maximum 30 solar masses for the black hole. Or even in some cases, we are inferring neutron stars for this uh, compact object. Uh, so what happens to the accretion this when the accretion rate is increasing? Uh, when the accretion rate is increasing, the vertical scale of this accretion rate is increasing until some point that this accretion, uh, this disk is very, very white and it is uh, optically thick. Uh, optically thin and geometrically thick. It's like its path and it's like a donut. And it was actually called by, uh, uh, now called like a Polish donut by some researchers. Polish donuts or slim disks. And this is the representation of one of these disks, like a Polish donut. Uh, this is the typical shape of a Polish donut without the hole in the middle that are the normal donuts. Uh, so what happens well, with the masses of the, uh, of the black holes being with 30 and 100 solar masses? So in this case, we have to move to another uh, away from the electromagnetic regime. We have to go through to the gravitational waves because they have given important clues into this aspect. We, uh, we have to thank to this uh, 17 Nobel Prize of the discovery of the gravitational waves to this three um, people here, Weiss, Barish, and Thorne, that are not astronomers, but are theorists, and they discover the, the gravitational waves. So if this is the range uh, or the ranges of solar mass of the black holes known as a function of the solar or, the, or their mass represented in solar masses, uh, we see that the actually, uh, the black, all the black holes with masses infrared in X-rays have a mass, mass lower uh, than 20 solar masses. Whilst uh, all the uh, uh, black holes with uh, masses higher than 20, until 70 more or less, or 100, have been uh, detected not the uh, electromagnetic counterpart because they don't emit in electromagnetic counterparts. We don't know why exactly why this happens. We have to discover it in the following years thanks to the interconnection between gravitational waves and electromagnetic facilities like this use, for example, or Athena or any other uh, satellite observing also in the electromagnetic counterparts. Uh, so uh, they have been detected uh, in, in gravitational waves uh, to have uh, these, these masses. Uh, so what is the 
current statistics and forecasts of the gray emitting black holes. So far, we have detected 66 black hole transients and they have been cataloged. Uh, and we have detected uh, 132 outbursts detected follow with in during the period in between 96 and 2015. Uh, they uh, typically have seven outbursts uh, or eight uh, have been detected uh, per year um, as from SWIFT and Integral. And it is expected to detect a mean value of two new objects per year with issues and with uh, this rate more or less, but uh, because it will have a wider field of view and we, we will detect even more. Uh, so majority of black hole transients emit during more than 100 days. So we expect to have a high developments in the field, in this field of X-rays, a time domain in black holes in the following years. I want to take here a note uh, out uh, about the iron K lines observed with, uh, with X-rays in AGNs. This is a, a hot topic uh, for Athena, future Athena, and probably we will detect something with Theseus, or if not with Theseus, with through the synergy Athena Theseus. Uh, it is important uh, to take uh, to detect with Athena the iron K lines because they give us information about the spin of the black holes. And this is a fundamental property, as I told you before in the beginning, of black holes. This is the X-ray spectrum obtained with XMM Newton during one of the longest, uh, by com the combination of one of the longest campaigns obtained with XMM Newton of the AGN 1H0707. It was published in Nature in the 2009 by Fabian and co-authors, including myself. And we, we discovered uh, that there was not only the iron K line, but there was even more powerful iron line in the L band. Uh, because this is a very uh, intense feature, we um, understood that we could um, uh, and, uh, uh, understand the reflection from the inner most parts of the accretion disks through the study of this iron L instead of this iron K line that is typically very weak. This uh, you borrow, uh, brought us to a new era of understanding X-rays uh, and brought us to the study of the lags uh, versus frequency that is here, when the reverberation lags in, in X-rays. Before this, there was no, there were no studies of reverberation in X-rays. So if we study the emission from this line uh, with respect to the power law emission line, uh, we, we see that there is a delay of a few seconds. And this delay can be understood as the delay of the photons coming from the corona and being reflected to the accretion disk, in the most parts accretion disk. That is emitting also to the observer, but with a lack, with a time lag. And this is called also the X-ray reverberation time lag. Uh, here we have a model uh, that through the understanding of these lags, we cannot infer only the spin of the black hole, but we can also infer the height of this Corona that is uh, also understood as the base of the jet, and the X-ray emitting jet, and probably the jet uh, in radio as well. But these things is not confirmed so far. We still need to uh, study these synergies, X-rays, uh, radio, infrared, um, so blah, blah, blah. So through some years, uh, I have been studying this reverberation from some AGNs. There are also some people as well that have been uh, studying this reverberation as well. These co-authors, uh, I mean Wilkins, Taylor and Reynolds, Heineken and Young, they propose different scenarios, but the, most, the one most compatible with the data is the corona that is uh, not very extended horizontally, uh, but is like a spherical blow that is moving in the, along the jet of this spinning black hole upwards. Uh, so this corona that is moving upwards would give rise to the phenomenology observed for the longest uh, observed AGN so far, at least as far as we understand. Uh, so what uh, what can we, with issues, we not be able to understand uh, to, to, the, to do this time lag analysis for AGN because it's not sensitive enough, as I told you. Uh, it will be more done for uh, with uh, Athena, 
that we have the sensitivity enough, good enough for that, thanks to its uh, great sensitivity. But we can do some um, study of X-ray flares coming from nearby, for example, normal stars. The, if we this is a normal star and this is the typical flare from a normal star, uh, we can the, the flare is emitting in high gamma rays or, or X, hard X rays, and the the this the the flare where where it is uh, connecting to the to the star is emitting in X rays. Uh, the, this region of the star is emitting in X rays through fluorescence. Uh, and also in optical in, in these areas, what, uh, what is called uh, with a delay of no hyper effect, uh, we, if, we, if we study these delays, we can study the infer, we can infer the geometry of this protuberance flares as well. Uh, we can, this is something that already can be done with the sun and with some uh, dwarf red dwarf stars during their big flares. Uh, and this is, uh, for example, this is uh, the radio spectrum from one of these flaring stars. We can see that there is an iron line, iron care line here. And uh, when it's simulated with Theseus, we, we can see this beautiful more uh, line, more powerful line with Theseus than it is with Swift. And with the, this is the light course that we're really detecting with uh, in, in optical and with issues, very intense also uh, light course, uh, more intense than though it has been detected so far with XGs, assimilated uh, with a delay that is can be interpreted in the in no hyper scenario, but you can see more clues in this paper by Meregeti et al. 2021. And this is my conclusions. Uh, so uh, regarding black holes uh, with issues, Black hole transients show spectral states characterized by different spectral shapes and timing properties during their outbursts. They explain in terms of changes in the geometry of the accretion flow around the central object, disentangling the main components that contribute to the overall X-ray energy budget and follow a spectral evolution of accretion flow will be carried out by Theseus thanks to its wide field of view combined with the world with its broad uh, band energy coverage. Simultaneous observations will be triggered with high energy spectral resolution telescopes like a thin as well, and radio and gamma ray uh, gamma ray sensitivity telescopes as SKE and CTA, which will be complementary to Theseus for a comprehensive accretion eject uh, ejection uh, study of these sources. Theseus offers the unique capacity to perform a strictly simultaneous X-ray and near infrared observations. During outbursts, infrared fluxes are known to trace the X-ray emission are thought to be an indicator of the strength of gate activity in black hole transients. And that simultaneous observation of these bands will lead to advances in our understanding of jet disk coupling in black hole transients. And also an opportunity for investigating sources in the highly accreting regime close and not above the Eddington limit. So this is the end of my talk and thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Maria, for this uh, wonderful view of the Theseus missions and the using in black holes. Yes. And as usual, the, the talk is open, is open for questions. Please uh, raise your hand and do the questions. Uh, I have one, Maria, if... Uh, I can use this for breaking the ice. Uh, my field of view is not black holes, but a nor uh, X rate, but it's uh, transient astronomy. Observing uh, occultations by solar system objects. And this mission has a very nice telescope in the near infrared that, that we can use it. So the mission is open for uh, researches or research investigations in other fields that there are not uh, X-rays or black holes. Yes, exactly. We are uh, now working on on the deeper on the synergies working um, group package uh, that I don't belong. I not head, but uh, I know about it. 
uh, we are proposing to use also the infrared telescope to um, because um, it will be during the survey mode, uh, it will be operating, uh, maybe not observing targets of interest, but uh, for uh, but uh, I mean in the in the field of view of these targets. Sometimes there will be sources that are not interesting in er in X-rays, but because they are interesting in other fields like exoplanets community, we got we got Andrew Blaine. In the in as a chair of this group, and he is very active in the infrared other topics that is not particularly tandem in uh, uh, astronomy, Good. and also I guess also objects from the solar system as where well, we are. Yeah. Can you show again the the slide that that the slide was uh, with some problems? So I want to see the resolution of the spectrograph. Sorry for going behind. That one. Yeah. This. Yeah, yeah. Resolution 20. Nice. Wow. This is exactly what we want. Very low resolution. Yeah. Yes, it's not very, I mean. Yeah, we it's have exactly what, what we need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. So I will write to you. OK, we have another question here, Pepa. Go on, please. Hello, good morning. Congratulations, Maria. Thank I, you. I enjoy very much uh, your talk. It has been very nice and very helpful uh, to know about this the show satellite. I have two questions. The first one is uh, why they reject uh, uh, the show satellite uh, in ESA? Um, ambition was the supported mission because uh, I mean now we we are entering into the time domain astrophysics from many point of view from black hole for the people like me that study supermassive black hole the I don't know the people who study study planet or everything so that is that is uh, strange to me. Um, which are the real plan for the SEO satellites when it will be ready? Okay, so the reasons that ISA gave to us is that the, the mission was, uh, I mean, at the end of the game, there were two competing missions only that were Theseus and Ambition. Mm -hmm. And ISA has given the, the reasons that the Theseus was slightly over, over too expensive for being only is a contribution. Uh, and it was, uh, I mean, ambition is a mission that was had NASA contribution as well, and was uh, within the same budget. Uh, this was uh, probably one of the reasons that, because we were limited only to the European budget, it was slightly too expensive for ISA because they had to cover many items of the satellite. So this was one of the main reasons. And the other one, um, I don't remember now, but <laughs> it was not so po powerful as the economical reason, I guess. Hmm. Yeah. No, because, uh, well, now we are uh, almost in the dark ages of X-ray astronomy uh, with XMM is, is getting older. Um, fortunately, we're lucky. Cross finger, <laughs> and, and and so that is uh, uh, the only on under my knowledge, the instrument that can perform this time domain is uh, analysis in X-ray is uh, Swift. And uh, how you make the comparison between Swift and and what you expect with the Zeus? Can you still do something? Yes. Why? Um, yes, yes. Uh, Swift, uh, well, we can compare, the, they are in purpose similar in goals because we want to un understand the locate uh, the gamma ray bars, but this use goes deeper because it has uh, an infrared telescope that can detect uh, uh, farther away uh, GRVs than uh, Swift does. 
Swift uh, has uh, on board only an ultra ultraviolet uh, telescope. Mm -hmm. It can we cannot detect redshifts very far away uh, because uh, counterparts very far away because of this limitation of the ultraviolet. But if we have a very powerful infrared telescope on board, we can detect uh, very high redshifts. So we can go detect uh, gamma ray bars that are occurring at redshifts between six and ten. Uh, uh, tens of them actually. With Swift has detected uh, 10 of them during 30 years of operation. We expect to detect, to detect tens of them during the first three first years of operations with Theseus. Mm -hmm. This is the main difference. Uh, another difference is that, uh, well, probably Theseus will, be, will have bigger field of view uh, than, than Swift uh, definitely will have bigger field of view, but uh, it's not uh, the main power because uh, Fermi has uh, is working currently and it also has a very big field of view, but it has not a, a, an infrared uh, telescope on board. So the main power of this is, the, is this also together with, with these X-ray telescopes with a very big field of view, the in, infrared telescope. This is the, the main power and difference between uh, all the, with, between existing and immediate future telescopes that will be operating like the Einstein telescope that will be operating also, but it has not infrared. Uh, no. to so this is basic. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thanks to you. For this next talk. More questions to Maria? So I, I was curious also to see how the pointing of the telescope would be, because it would they, they need to react very fast from one burst to, to the other or maybe to any other point. Yes. In, uh, so how it works? Yes, in this, in this case, NASA is the winner because SWIFT, uh, if it is called SWIFT, is because it is very swift and rapid uh, to repoint. I mean, like SWIFT, uh, SWIFT is the best. I mean, uh, SWIFT actually was, the idea was developed uh, for military reasons. And I, I, I don't want to say that uh, ours will not be as fast as Swift moving, but probably will not uh, as fast as Swift. But this will be compensated by the big field of view of this, of the, of the, of the telescopes that we will be having on board. So we really, we don't need to move as swift as swift <laughs> because it will be compensated by the big field of view. Okay. Very good. Okay, last opportunity to ask, ask any question to Maria. Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Maria, again for this uh, nice talk. Thanks to you. And uh, see you all next week that we have again two seminars uh, on Tuesday and Thursday. Thank you very much. Okay, bye.